Tonight we continue our studies in the book of Revelation. We had three messages on how bad the church at Laodicea was, and tonight is the sixth part of how we can avoid being like Laodicea, which is far more important, far more important to learn how to avoid being like Laodicea than looking at them and saying, very naughty, very bad, we don't like you, and then going away feeling smug that we're not like them when probably we are. So we're over in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, I'll read down through verse 22. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I know thou art cold or hot, solely because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold to try in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. What if as we sat here, there came a knocking at those doors in the back? Persistent, continuous, and it continued and continued and continued. Would we stop and go and open the door? Jesus may be standing outside our doors tonight, knocking, If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, unto the churches. Gracious Father, we pray that we will have an ear to hear what the Spirit says unto this church here. That you would teach us what is necessary to avoid being like Laodicea. Perhaps it's too late. But if there is even a spark of life, we pray that you will fan it until it becomes a flame, until it becomes a passionate flame, until it becomes an unquenchable flame that goes out from this place to reach others for Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. In the first half of our studies on how to avoid becoming like Laodicea, we learned that spiritual growth comes through a series of four systematic steps. That brought us to the second half of spiritual growth principles, and we saw that spiritual growth is accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to Him and follow His direction. We examined various verses related to God's responsibility, the divine side, what God has promised to do. Then we contrasted that with what we are accountable for, and putting the verses together in each of those two areas brought us to four conclusions. Conclusion number one, yielding to the Spirit produces the spiritual walk empowered by the Spirit. Conclusion number two, the Spirit strengthens the inner man, roots and grounds you in love, gives you an understanding of the love of Christ, which is infinite, fills you and works in you above that you could ever ask or think. Conclusion number three that we learned, the Holy Spirit works in you to control your will and your actions for his good pleasure as you yield to him. Conclusion number four was obviously only God can do certain things, but that is not an excuse for sloth on our part. There must be a connection between the human side of responsibility the side that engages our regenerated will, and the divine side of sovereignty. Now, when we began a study of what the Bible says about connecting the two sides so that the power flows into the circuit of our lives, that brought us to the question, how does God activate our side of the equation? In other words, what are the switches that God uses to bring about spiritual growth that prevents us from becoming like Laodicea? There are five switches. We've looked at one so far. There are five switches that the Holy Spirit uses. In other words, the Holy Spirit uses specific means of growth where he has commanded us to be involved. Remember, divine side, sovereignty. But the human side, you can't get out of the work that God called you to do. And when those two come together, they come together at the five switch points. We looked at switch number one. The first switch God use, uses to activate spiritual growth in our lives is continual reading of the Bible and continual obedience to it. You can't leave that part out. You see, as we obey, we receive illumination so that we can obey more. We studied Matthew 4, Philippians 2, James 1, and Acts 8, where we looked at the Ethiopian eunuch who hungered after the word of God and God changed the course of history to get a missionary, Philip, to him. As soon as the eunuch understood, he believed and was baptized. He took action. But he was already doing what he knew he was supposed to be doing. You cannot expect God to give you light in a brain vacuum. You're required to have a content package in your brain that you've put there by studying the Bible. The eunuch was also doing what he was required to do as a Jewish convert. He'd come part of the way, but he was obeying everything he knew how to do as a Jewish convert. He was going up to Jerusalem for the feasts. He was serious about knowing the will of God, but more importantly, he was serious about doing it. God answered his thirst for obedient knowledge. A lot of us have thirst for knowledge. That's irrelevant to God. He wants us to thirst for obedient knowledge. God does not give intellectual knowledge just to satisfy our idle curiosity. Bible study is switch number one used by the Holy Spirit. It has a purpose. It is designed to activate spiritual growth in our lives. I said this last week, but I'll say it again. If you are not activating spiritual growth when you make Bible study noises, something is wrong. Peter writes about the first switch that God uses to activate spiritual growth in our lives. 1 Peter 1.22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. On this first switch, we discover that spiritual growth includes two things. Number one, soul purification by obeying the Bible. Obviously empowered by the Spirit, that's the context. And number two, developing love for other Christians. 
where you see the fruit of this growth is the application. Love one another with a pure heart, and he adds one more word, the word that Jesus didn't see in the church at Laodicea. Fervently, that means with burning, passionate fire. Laodicea was neither hot nor cold, and so he was going to spew them out of his mouth. Love one another with a pure heart. Ah, we're not talking about carnal love. We're talking about love that comes from a pure heart. But it is passionate. It is burning. It ties the body of Christ together. We saw also how John writes about that first switch that God uses to activate spiritual growth in our lives. John makes it clear that the first switch which is not just Bible study, but obedience after we learn what it tells us to do. It's absolutely essential for overcoming the devil. If you don't activate switch number one, you will lose to the devil every time. Guaranteed. But you see, if you've activated switch number one, the devil will not be able to deceive you because you know the truth and how the truth applies to life. 1 John 2.14 I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now that brings us to tonight and we have new material we're starting now. That brings us to the second power switch <clears throat> which I just mentioned in passing last week which is unceasing prayer. Power switch number two is unceasing prayer prayer but it's not just prayer for ourselves it's prayer for other Christians do you understand that biblical prayer if you look at prayers in the Bible biblical prayer always moves away from self focus whenever you see anybody feeling sorry for themselves and praying about themselves in the Bible like Elijah I am not better than my father's. Well, so who told you you were? You know, I'm the only one left. Elijah, shape up. I have 7,000 men who have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. When we start praying prayers of self-pity, we're feeling sorry for ourselves, we've moved away from the biblical example that we've been given of praying for others. You know, if all of us did that here, you wouldn't have to worry about praying for yourself. Why? Because everybody else in this church would be praying for you. Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, if we actually passionately prayed for each other and for the specific needs that we knew the other people had, would that develop a love for others? The people you pray for that way you're drawn closer and closer to them and your passion for Christ grows more and more as you see him answering those prayers, as you see spiritual growth in the life of that person, as you see that person begin to witness to others and bring them to Christ. Biblical prayer focuses outside of self. Move away from the self-focus. Most of us have never learned to move away from praying for ourselves. Let's look at the examples that were set by the Apostle Paul. Hope you're jotting down references. Galatians chapter 4, because I'm going to give you about 20 different specific things that you can pray for other Christians tonight. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. Paul compares his prayer life to a woman in labor. Now, some of you women have been there. You've done that. You know the pain. Paul says, that's the way I pray for other Christians. It's like trying to give birth, trying to give birth, trying to give birth. You go into transition, and then it's pant, blow, pant, blow, pant, blow. Come on, sweetheart, you can make it. You can make it. You can make it. I stood there next to Judy as she gave birth to all 13 of our children. I caught the baby in several cases, cut the umbilical cords. I saw what she went through. 
Paul knew what it was like. I think most of you know what it's like. If not experientially, at least you know about it. That's how Paul prayed for other believers. He didn't just say, Dear Lord, please bless um, John and Mary and Bill and Joe and let's see who else is in our church. Oh, pull out the prayer uh, list. Oh, yeah, there's and Mary and Sam and Willie. That's not how Paul prayed. He didn't run through a list and say, and bless all of them and give them all the money they need and uh, help them all to be healthy and well. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul never prayed prayers like that. Never. But that's the kind of prayers that we usually pray for other people. And those prayers stink. They hit the ceiling, they bounce down, and they rot on the floor. Let's look at some of Paul's prayers. Ephesians chapter 1. Let me read you verses 15 through um, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, 1, verse 15, and then chapter uh, 3, verses 14 and 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, now, aha, they're saved, but they've also started to grow. Did you notice the second half of that verse? Your love unto all the saints. Now look at verse 16. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What did he pray for them? First he gave thanks. Then he prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, one, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, two, in the knowledge of him, which is what you learn from the Bible. In other words, there are two specific requests. Number two has two parts to it. But first of all, prayer requests that you can pray for other believers in this church. Number one, thank God for them. When was the last time you thanked God for somebody in this church? I mean, I've heard some of you say, oh, I thank God for you, Pastor. Okay, how about somebody else? Somebody else. Do you have reason to thank God for them? Have you had opportunity to minister in their lives and see the gratitude that they would give if you would minister to them? Number one, thanksgiving. Number two, that God would give them wisdom and knowledge from the Bible. Lord, please bless so-and-so as they study the word today. First of all, convict them. Get them into the Bible. They may not be doing the Bible today. They may be running around doing nut nutty kind of stuff, but get them into the Bible. And then I pray that you give them wisdom and knowledge as you reveal Christ to them in your word. And if you know specific things about their lives, you can say, give them insight onto this particular issue because they don't seem to be getting it. Paul's praying that way for people he's not even close to. This is the church at Ephesus. That's why he's writing the letter. He's far, far away. Look at chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a position of humility, of submission. Now look at verse 15. This is a really important verse. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now I think I've done this with you all. I did this, uh, I was teaching a class at the Evangelical Theological Seminary up in Tawaka, New Jersey, 35 or 40 years ago, and um, I gave a little um, quiz to my students there at that time. We were studying the book of Ephesians, and I said, uh, it, it was on a little quiz that I gave them, and uh, I said, uh, how many times does the word family show up in the New Testament? And then I gave them a range, a range uh, 10 to 15, uh, 8 to 10, 6 to 8, 3 to 6, 1 to 3. How many of you know? Which range is it? 
How many of you think it's uh, 10 to 15? Now, I think I've done this here before, so uh, I may not, you know, may, nobody will bite, but how, how many of you think it's 10 to 15? How many of you think it's 8 to 10? How many of you think it's uh, 6 to 8? How many of you think it's um, 4 to 6? How many of you think it's 1 to 3? Oh, good, you've heard it. <laughs> so the question is, how many times? One, two, or three? Ah, this little light of mine, I see it over here. It's one. <laughs> one. This is the only place in the entire New Testament where the word family shows up. And Paul is praying for specific family. Did you get that? This is what's called a hapax legomena. It means it's the only place it occurs in the entire New Testament. Now, why is that striking? Because the word family is found 122 times in 75 verses in the Old Testament. What changed? It's found 122 times in 75 verses in the Old Testament. You see, now that we're in the church from the divine viewpoint, you now have a new family when you got saved. If your physical family is saved, they're also in that new family. But God sees you in his family because he is your heavenly, what? Father. He's your father. Biblical families are classified under their father. That's the family where Paul focuses his prayers. And he had at least six specific items on his prayer list as he was praying for them in Ephesians chapter 3. Now look down at verse 16. Here is prayer request number one. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. You can pray that for each other. Here is prayer request number two. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Remember, he's bowing his knees to the Father and asking the Father to do these things for the, the believers at Ephesus. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Three, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love. Oh, Lord, make the church at Ephesus rooted and grounded in love. Dear people, do you remember this is Ephesus? What was the condemnation of Ephesus in the book of Revelation? I have somewhat against thee because thou hast lost thy first love apparently after Paul went to heaven there was nobody praying that for one another at Ephesus how are the mighty fallen I hope you pray that for me. I pray that for you. Because sometimes I don't see it. That was request number three. Request number four is in verse 18. That you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height Number five, and to know the love of Christ, which patheth knowledge. Number six, that she might be filled with all the fullness of God. And we've talked about that in the past. Here are six more things that you can pray for other believers in this church. Philippians chapter one, beginning in verse eight. Six more things. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now, 
We use those words a little differently today, but that's a very deep-seated love that he had for them. That's one of the two key goals, remember, of true spiritual growth, is love for the brethren. And I pray, so here is his prayer request, and he's got six of them. And this I pray, that one, your love may abound yet more and more. Dear people, Paul prayed that for all of the believers in all of the churches. Do you ever pray it for each other here? Remember, we're, we're trying to not become like the church at Laodicea. The church at Laodicea was lukewarm. They weren't passionate about anything. But he calls on us to have a passionate love for him. And when we do that, we'll have a passionate love for one another. This I pray that number one, your love may abound yet more and more. Now at the end of this particular passage, we're going to see something that ties us into the morning message. We're going to see something that deals with fruit bearing, which means something that deals with abiding in Christ. And love is one of the fruit of the Spirit, and that's where he begins. Two, in the knowledge and in all judgment. Three, that you may approve things that are excellent. Four, that you may be sincere. Five, that you may be without offense until the day of Christ. Six, that you may be filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. Seven, unto the glory and praise of God, not to your own human aggrandizement. Seven specific things that are given to us here. Paul prayed that for the church at Philippi. Do you pray that for one another? Don't ever say that you can't think of anything to pray for other believers in this church other than for their health, wealth, and prosperity. I've just shown you 15 things that you can pray for other people sitting in the pews with you. But that's not all. Here are eight more things that you can pray for me and others here at this church. Colossians chapter 1. I'll begin in verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, now get the next words, do not cease to pray for you. What did he pray for them? One, to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Oh God, I pray that so and so and they're sitting down the pew for me right now. They seem to be directionless. They don't seem to understand what is your will other than to just sort of muddle through every day of the week. They don't seem to understand what your will is in relation to service. They don't seem to understand what your will is in relation to witnessing. They don't seem to understand what your will is in relation to holiness. They don't seem to understand what your will is in relation to setting goals for serving Christ. Do you pray that for each other? That you would pray that so and so not just for yourself. We all want God's will, theoretically. Oh, Lord, show me your will. Okay. Are you praying that for somebody else? Paul prayed that for other people. That you may approve things are excellent under the glory and praise of God. I do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Two, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That reflects something we've just heard a minute ago in Philippians. Three, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. 
Ah, there's the practical application of knowing the will of God and of walking in wisdom. Number four, being fruitful in every good work. Ah, here we are, fruit bearing. Five, increasing in the knowledge of God. In other words, not being stagnant. Not thinking, well, I know enough theology to get by, so I really don't need to worry about the rest of that stuff. I mean, that's all deep Bible study, and you know, why in the world should I go to school? Why should I take classes? Why should I do anything online? Why should, why should I get a commentary and begin to study the commentary along with my scripture reading each day? It says, increasing in the knowledge of God. You say, well, I know all about God. I, I, I've got the catechism memorized. Oh, well, I don't have it memorized, but, but I, I do flip through it every now and then. And if I come to Sunday school, I, I get to hear at least one of them a week. And that, that's pretty good. No, it's not. When you want to get to know somebody, you spend time with them. Have you increased in your knowledge of God? We say, I know he's omnipotent. I know he's omnipresent. I know he's omniscient. Uh, let's see, he's good. Uh, he's loving. Uh, God is love. Uh, let's see, is there anything else? Yeah, there's a lot more. Even if you took a course in theology proper, you wouldn't know everything about God. As you study the word of God, and as you pray for one another, to have the other person's eyes open, not merely your own, you know what will happen? You'll be talking to them one day and they'll say, man, you know, I just saw the most exciting thing in the word of God about the character of God. Let me share it with you. And you listen, you say, whoa, I didn't know that. And you both begin to interact and say, well, I saw this. And they say, I didn't know that. And you are drawn closer together because your focal point is the same. And you've been praying this prayer for each other. You will never become like Laodicea. We want to avoid Laodicea. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11. Strengthened with all might. This is, this is prayer request number six. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Prayer request number seven. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Not just patience and long suffering, but with joyfulness. There are specific modifiers to each one of these requests. Number eight. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, that is fitting, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. I just gave you 23 different requests that you can pray for one another, not just for yourself. Now, obviously there's some overlap in those passages as to what Paul prayed for other believers. But you're smart enough and you can easily sort that out. But to do that, you have to study the passages and pray these things until they become your automatic petitions instead of, dear God, please heal the wart on my nose. You know, that's not the kind of prayer request that we see Paul giving. But there are other passages that don't seem like a list of prayer requests that Paul was praying for others. But when you study the passages, you discover that they really are what he prayed for other people. Let me give you an illustration of this. Let's look over at Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 28. We got down through verse 12. Now we're jumping down to verse 28. He's been talking about Jesus, and he says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You see, that doesn't sound like a prayer request, but actually there are three obvious prayers in that verse because it shows us what Paul's desire for the Colossians was. There are three things. Number one, he preached Christ to them. Ergo, his prayer for them was that they would know Christ. Number two, he warned them. Ergo, his prayer for them was that they would get their spiritual act together. They had something wrong, and that's why he was warning them. Number three, it says, he taught them in all wisdom. Ergo, his prayer for them was that they would learn. As you read the writings of Paul, and you see what his desire is for people, you know that's what he was praying 
for people. And you can pray it for others too. Now, all of that is summarized by his overarching prayer for them, which is at the end of that verse, that he could present every one of them as mature in Christ Jesus. That's the word translated perfect. It's the word teleos, which means fully grown and mature. His goal was to get them out of spiritual babyhood and bring them to spiritual maturity. That's what he's praying for them. But there's more. Look down now at verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So here we find the light switch has been flipped, and Paul is doing his part, and the Holy Spirit is doing the divine part, and the Holy Spirit is working in him in a mighty way, and what comes out of that is what we see in chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. Ha, 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 ha. Look at the next phrase. Look at the next phrase. And for them at Laodicea, we're studying the church at Laodicea. Paul was desperately praying for them, just like he was desperately praying for the church at Colossae. But Laodicea had put up a wall against Paul's prayers because they were focused on things of earth. That's deadly, folks. Where's the focus of your heart? Where is the focus of your heart? The Odyssea looked around. They thought they were cool. They were rich. They had nice clothes. They didn't need anything. They had a, a spring there that made mud that people put on their eyes and they, you know, could help their sight. They were healthy. And didn't know that they were poor and blind and wretched and naked. Where's your focus? And for them that are at Laodicea and them in Hierapolis, which is one of the three cities in that region. That brings us to the third switch. Our time is almost up. I wonder, is my watch right or is this clock right? The clock says 10 after. My watch says 2 after. It's 2 after? Okay, then I can go on. The third switch is the presentation of our bodies to the Lord. The Holy Spirit lives inside you, obviously, so this is a, a switch that easily can be turned on. But you've got to make the presentation. Number one was study of the word and obedience when God helps you understand it. Number two is prayer, not for yourself, but praying for others. The third switch is the presentation of our bodies to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and suddenly the power will start to flow when you do this. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and following. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now we see some human responsibility here. This is what you are supposed to do. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Every one of us here has a mortal body, and we live in it. And that's why we're here tonight, and we can be seen, is we're living in a mortal body. But there are different things that control the mortal body. Some of them are outside enemies, and some of them are inside enemies. The devil and the demons would love to get you involved through the use of your body in things that bring 
great shame to the Lord Jesus Christ. The world would love to get you to use your body to do the things that the world does. But the most insidious enemy is the one that's inside of you, and that's the flesh. The old sin nature, the OSN, Your old sin nature will be with you until you die and go to heaven. You are always going to be fighting a Quisling, the guy who betrayed Norway in World War II. He's an insider. He can open gates from the inside. And you have to watch all the time because he's always there. But you're supposed to do something about that insider. You are to crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts. And as long as the flesh is nailed to the cross, it will scream and yell, but it can't get down. But you know we compromise. We don't like to listen to the yelling and screaming and we'd really like to have things a little quieter and pleasanter and so we let the flesh down and the flesh says, oh, thank you so much. Uh, in fact, I, I, I'm so happy that you let me down. Let's go out and have a beer together. <laughs> flesh is always trying to get you to do something like that. So, number one is refuse to let it rule. And what is the issue? Obedience. When you know the word of God, what's the issue? The first thing that the Holy Spirit uses as a light switch is obedience to the Bible. Now here, the flesh is trying to get you to obey it in the lusts thereof. This is a war of obedience. Whom are you going to obey? You're going to obey somebody or something. Either you're going to obey Jesus as he reveals himself in the word of God or you're going to obey the world, the flesh, and the devil. You have no other options. You are, whether you like it or not, a servant and you will serve someone. Paul wasn't ashamed to call himself a doulos, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Whether you like it or not, you're a servant. You're not independent, you're a servant. So am I. The question is, whom will we obey? You're going to obey somebody with every thought, word, action, attitude, and motive. You're going to obey someone. Who will it be? Let not sin reign in your body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Ah, so now we have the issue of submission. Three weeks ago, I talked about that. We talk about it in the morning worship service too, remember? The kinds of offerings that the children of Israel brought to the golden calf. One of them was an offering of submission. They were saying the golden calf was their boss. Now here you're going to have to make a choice. This is your side of the equation. Neither yield ye your members, that means the members of your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. You can use the different parts of your body to commit sin. You can use your eyes to commit sin by what you look at. You can use your ears to commit sin by what you listen to. You can use your mouth to commit sin by what you take in. You obviously can use your hands to commit sin and your feet to go places where you ought not to go. I mean, you can use the members of your body to commit sin. He says, do not yield to that, but yield yourselves unto God. So you have a negative responsibility and you have a positive obligation. You see, you, you're presenting your body as a living sacrifice to Christ. You're not just presenting your spirit to Christ. You're not just presenting your soul to Christ. You're presenting your body, and so you have to do something with your body 
when you make the presentation. That's switch number three. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, instead of instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Now he's going to talk about something very interesting in this context. Having dominion means that that's somebody who's ruling over you. What is the next thing that he says? For you are not under the law, but under grace. You say, no, 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 wait a minute, Paul. The law said I couldn't do certain things, and the law said I had to do certain things. The law said I, I couldn't eat uh, pork and shellfish and all that kind of stuff, and, and the law said I had to go, to go to synagogue on the Sabbath. But, but now grace... I don't have to worry about those things anymore. Well, there's still the moral law of God, which is restated in the New Testament, but all the ceremonial stuff. He said, you're under grace. But grace is not the same thing as lasciviousness. Grace is not the right to do things you want to do. Grace is the empowerment to do the things that you ought to do. I hope you've memorized that. You've heard me say it a hundred times. You're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Oh boy, I'm not under the law anymore. I can go out and have a party time. Boy, that's the question. Is that what we're supposed to do because we're not under the law? He says, God forbid. Know you not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. Remember I told you a minute ago, we are servants, whether we like it or not. We are going to serve somebody or something. But you have a choice as to whom you're going to serve. Do not make the wrong choice. Know you not that you, to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey. Remember, he's just been talking about yielding our members as instruments of righteousness to God. His servants you are to whom you obey. You can pretend that you're not that, the servant of Joe. Here's Joe and Bill, and Joe has a, a servant over here, and Bill has a servant over here, and Joe's servant decides he's going to obey Bill for a while. He belongs to Joe, but he's going to do what Bill tells him to do. He says, don't you realize you're the servant to the one that you're obeying? Now, Jesus is your Lord. You belong to him. It is really stupid to quit obeying him and go over here where the devil, the world, the flesh, and the demons are and saying, what do you want me to do? Hey, give me my orders and I'll, I'll march to them. That is stupid. You suddenly become the servant of the world, flesh, devil, and demons. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey? whether of sin unto death or of obedience. Ah, we're back to obeying, aren't we? Obedience unto righteousness. You know, obedience is very, very key to everything that God has to say in the Bible because he didn't put it there for our intellectual knowledge to puff ourselves up. He put it there as an instruction manual for what we should be doing. We saw that when we studied the book of James. Verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, past tense, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Doctrine has practical application. If all you want to learn is doctrine... Well, now I know all the five points of Calvinism, and I can tell you all the verses that relate to, to TULIP, uh, you know, uh, uh, total depravity, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Man, I got it in my head. TULIP. You missed the point. You have obeyed from the heart. That's not surface law obedience. You have obeyed from the heart 
that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Instead of focusing on all the things that God has done, which is all those doctrines relate to the sovereignty of God and what he's doing, learn the doctrines that relate to your responsibility and start obeying them. That's Paul's point here. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants. That means you're serving, you're doing. The servants of righteousness. Well, our time is up now, but at least we got partway through Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at Romans 6, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 6 before we get to the fourth power switch. But how important is this? The presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again that you have called us to obedience not merely called us to head knowledge so that we can rattle off theology. You've called us to obey. We can analyze and we can parse and we can divide and see cool parallels and verses that Paul wrote and follow his arguments. And, but if we don't obey it, it has done us no good. Father, teach us to obey as we study it you will give us light even as you did with the Ethiopian eunuch and then you expect us to respond like the eunuch did in obedience so that we can go on our way rejoicing and be a witness as he was and brought Christianity to Ethiopia we may be the very key to opening a new area to the ministry of Christ because we obeyed on one occasion that which you showed us. Father, we pray that you will take your word and apply it to our hearts this night, that we might learn the switches so that we do not become like the church at Laodicea. What joy it is to know Jesus and to desire Jesus to passionately love him and to love one another and pray one for another that we might grow together in him. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.